Hello, New York Giants fans, and welcome to a new edition of the Valentine's Views podcast. If you're watching us on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening across the Big Blue View Radio Network, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, Giants fans, it's time to begin to try to spin forward a little bit from Sunday's debacle against the Dallas Cowboys and as we do that, as we look forward to uh, Sunday's game with the Arizona Cardinals and uh, start trying to uh, to look ahead to the rest of the 2023 NFL season here to help me uh, help me do that is Patricia Traina of Giants Country and Locked On Giants. Patty, how are you? I'm trying to unspin my own head, Ed, from Sunday's debacle. <laughs> that was something else, man. But uh, yeah, we get there. I, Never, never saw that coming. You, you know, I should have, I, I, I should have known better than to pick the Giants, but I, I never saw forty to nothing coming. But none know, that, of us that, did. None of us did. And uh, you know, now you just, uh, you said you've got to, you've got to unravel and, and, and you know, try to get away from that game. And let me actually start with this, as we do try to spin forward. We've talked to Brian Dayball a couple times. In the post game, we talked to Dayball. On Monday on a Zoom call, we talked to Dayball. And, you know, he said you have to own it, and then you have to move forward from it. And he'll try to move forward from it. The Giants players will try to move forward from that. But I still, it, to me, yes, there's 16 games left in the season. It's one loss. But it still feels bad bigger than that it just feels more monumental than zero and one you know on you know in the standings just because of the build-up to it who the game was against the fact that that Dallas and Philly are basically the targets for the Giants it just feels bigger than that because it feels like it sent a bigger message than just one loss yeah, I, I totally get that. But, you know, also remember at the, at the, before the start of the season, both Dable and Joe Shane said, we're not going to know what this team is like or what this team is all about until we play a few games. Well, based on this one game, we have a pretty good idea of, of you know, what the team is, is like. And, and to be fair, and I'm not trying to make excuses, but to be fair, how many snaps would you say the starters on both sides of the ball played all all preseason? Probably not a lot. You know, we, we, we look at the offensive line, which was an absolute disaster. How many snaps did that unit have together in games? What You know, they, they dragged out the, the starting guard competition basically until the bitter end. And, you know, there's something all to be said about – yeah, and there's something to be said about, you know, establishing chemistry and cohesiveness, you know, so I'm not trying to make excuses because I didn't see 40 nothing coming. I mean, let's be honest here. I did not see it coming. I thought they would be, you know, a little bit more cohesive, but this giant team, they're, they're finding out what they have, what they need to do. And, oh, by the way, the play calling, I mean, were you happy with the play calling on offense? I know I had some questions about it. But I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who who thought that they shouldn't have given up on the run as quickly as they did, you know, and and, and just gone to the pass on a night that was sloppy, that was wet, that the offensive line couldn't block, pass block for, for you know, their lives. So I, I don't know, Just it just seemed like from top to bottom, the whole team was just out of whack. And we just hope that moving forward, they get together and and clean up a lot of these issues that they had in the, the season opener. <laughs> Agreed with that, Patty. The one thing I'm not so sure that I want to criticize the play calling. I mean, I look at it and I think it was 16 to nothing, 13 minutes into the game. It was 26 to nothing at halftime. You know, what, what point is there in running the ball at some point at what point is there in running the ball? unless you're just trying to keep the clock running and get the game over with at, well, at some, I, I get it, but it's at some point at some, you're not going to, you're not going to get back in the game running the ball. No, you're not. But, but hear me out on this. It was 16, nothing. If I'm not mistaken, after the first quarter, am I right? Mm -hmm. 
So you've got three quarters to catch up. I, I just felt like they, they went away from maybe the strength of their game plan. Now I could see the argument being made in the second half, you know, when the game really got out of control, but teams have come back from, you know, 16 point deficits. It's been done before. So I just felt like the play calling on offense that maybe they moved away from the run game a little too soon because, I mean, they were having success on that first drive. I just did, you know, I just wrote something for Giants country. I think they had um, Barkley and Matt Breida run the ball on half of the drives. They had a 10 play drive before things started going backwards for them and they were running the ball. And they were moving the chains. They went from their 25 all the way down to the Cowboys eight before they started going backwards. So after that, it was like, okay, what happened here? It's, it's almost like they panicked or something. So that was, you know, to me, that's, that's an issue I had with the game. I get it in the second half. Okay. We got to try and clean things up. We got to catch up and everything like that. But your, your offensive line's not blocking. The weather is garbage. You know, it's not conducive to, to to the to the you know the passing game. I was just surprised that they didn't run the ball a little bit more to try to get something going, and then maybe see if they could set up the pass for better success. No, I I get it. I just I think that among all of the issues that they had, I mean, the play calling just wasn't one that 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 I focused on anyway. I mean, the big issue we all know what the big issue was, Patty. The big issue was, of course, the offensive line and specifically the right side of the offensive line. And look, that's a question that we've all had for months. I think we've all had that question. Would the offensive line be good enough? I've written over and over at Big Blue View that that the offensive line, what it really comes down to in terms of improvement, yes, they, they added John Michael Schmitz, but it really comes down to whether Evan Neal improves or not. And son, and you know, Mark Lewinsky is what he is. And that was an awful game on Sunday. Maybe the worst game he's ever played in his career. He's not as bad as he looked, but I look at it and I think everybody's calling for Justin Pugh to be signed or Dalton Risner to be signed. And, and I know Justin Pugh would love to be a giant. But there's no easy fix, Patty. You know, Justin Pugh, I think I, I did a, a video today. Justin Pugh's not a magic fix for the offensive line. He needs a few weeks to get ready anyway. And he's a 33-year-old guy coming off a torn ACL. We don't know what he we don't know what he can do. Yeah. So I mean, what when you look at the offensive line situation, is there a fix other than just being patient and not going berserk over one bad game is there a fix um there's a temporary solution that they can do i mean let's face it tackles don't grow on trees okay if they if, if it were that simple i think they would have addressed it a long time ago um evan neal is a first round draft pick i don't think they're going to give up on him after just one you know, poor game, even though people will say, well, it's a continuation of last year. But here's the thing I didn't get. And again, this kind of goes back to play calling scheming. Why didn't they keep an extra blocker in when they saw that the line was struggling? Is that suddenly outlawed? Now I get it. It takes away a, an option in the passing game, but if your quarterback is running around for his life, all right. So what if you pull somebody back from the passing game? you know, to give your quarterback a chance to throw the ball. That was another thing I didn't get. And, you know, I was, I was, I'm watching this and I'm saying, gosh, I, I mean, I don't think we saw a whole lot of max protect in, in, in that game against Dallas. So I don't know, maybe the answer is for the time being, at least until this offensive line establishes itself and, you know, shakes off the, the rust or whatever you want to call it from last week, maybe you keep it an extra blocker to help especially when you're facing the really, really good defenses that are coming down the pipe for this, this Giants team. I think that is definitely an option. I thought that the Giants did do some of that, at least chipping with the tight end and chipping with the running back. I thought they I know, tried I to do some of that, but 
I know there were a lot of formations where the right side was overloaded, but maybe they didn't do it enough. And I think, I think they're going to have to help that side. Yeah. I definitely. don't know. You know, as you said with Evan Neal, he's a first round draft pick. You're not moving him to guard right now. It's just not happening. Mm. The look, if he's terrible this year, if he doesn't show signs of improvement, then, then yeah, you move him to guard. You, you go to free agency and look for a right tackle, or you go to the draft and look for a right tackle. You have kind of a natural progression because Mark Glowinski's not going to be a giant after this year. He's, yeah, I'd you know, be he's surprised. In this, he's in the second year of that three-year contract. He's got no guaranteed money after this year. He's not going to be a giant after this year. You, you, in 2024, maybe you move Neil inside. The thing about Evan Neal, let me ask you this. Nick Filato, who you know well, has been talking about this, and I keep hearing about this with Evan Neal. And, and the more I watch Neal, the more I think I agree. We all thought that he was a tremendous athlete coming out of Alabama. I don't think he's athletic, and I don't think he moves as well maybe as we all thought he did. I think sometimes he's a little clunky and, and maybe his footwork's not clean and he's not quite as as nimble maybe as we thought he was. And I think that's a big part of the problem. Bingo. That is that is part of the problem. The footwork, you know, over at Inside Football, we wrote about how heavy-footed he, he was. We talked about, you know, just the movement and the mirroring and the angles and stuff how sometimes he's top heavy, which means, you know, he, he sometimes he could be like leaning at the waist as opposed to bending at the knees like you like you want them to. So it, it almost looks like and, you know, Ed, you and I during the summer, we talked about this. I remember, you know, talking about this with you on the sideline. We talked about how comfortable does Evan Neal look as he tries to get or find a stance that works for him. And, you know, you watch him pass in his pass block. And how many times did I say to you in the press box the other night, oh, look, he's, he's pulling back his hand and he's starting like a split second too soon. And it's amazing that they don't, they don't call it on him. And you said, well, you know, they don't see it. They can't call it. But I saw it, you know, and, and I know he's been called for it before, you know, in the preseason. So you could just tell he's he's it's almost like he's just not comfortable with what he's doing and. You know, I don't know if it's a technique issue or or what it is, but they better figure it out fast because this this is yeah. alarming that he's basically kind of picked up where he's left off last year and not in a good way. Yeah, it is, Patty, and 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 it has to get better. But again, who's going to play right tackle if Evan Neal doesn't at this point? Look at the situation that the Giants are in. We don't know if Andrew Thomas is going to be available on Sunday. We, you know, there were reports today that that his MRI showed that there's no long-term injury, but but he might not be available on Sunday. We don't know if Matt Paird can play on Sunday. So if Evan Neal, if, if Evan Neal doesn't play right tackle, who's going to play there? You know, they they have no choice because right now I don't know who the left tackle is. Is it, it's Josh Azudu, I think. Yeah, I, it, would, it would probably have it to would, be Josh. It would have to be. But, you know, just the, the only other thought I have on Glowinski is, look, if things go south and he continues to play poorly, you can go to Marcus McKeithen eventually, or you can go to, you know, you, you can go to, to Azudu if he's able to move in back inside, or you, you – you could even dust off Shane Lemieux. You could do something, but 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 really, the answer the the, the long term answer probably doesn't come until the draft or or next off season. They're going to have to make do with what they have, and and it, I just keep coming back to the fact that the offensive line, whether it gets better from last year or not comes down to whether or not Evan Neal gets better. That's just where it is. Yeah. I mean, one guy can can send the whole house of cards tumbling. That's for sure. And, you know, look, it's one game. 
you know, giant fans, you know, media, we, we all have a tendency to panic because unfortunately that's how we've been conditioned for the last, you know, 10 plus or so years when something goes wrong, it just collapses. Um, but you just hope that the next 16 games makes this one bad game against Dallas look like, you know, we're a situation where we could say, oh, we'll sit back and we'll laugh at it. You know, that, that he starts to, to find that comfort level. Now, you know, I've been saying this all along. People are expecting him to take the leap that Andrew Thomas took. Andrew Thomas's situation in his rookie season was a lot different than Evan Neal's. Andrew Thomas went through multiple coaches, each of whom had their own ideas to how to, you know, do things. And it messed up with him, you know, it messed with him. Once they stabilized him, he started to play better. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Andrew Thomas also had a revolving door next to him as a rookie at left guard. All right. Evan Neal, a little different situation. He's had the same position coach. Glowinski has been next to him, you know, for, for the bulk of his snaps. It's up to the kid to just, you know, batten down the hatches, so to speak, and, and just take the, the coaching he's getting and find that comfort level. And, and so far, I, I just, I'm not sure he's done that. I would agree, Patty. Part of it can be sometimes when you are changing your technique, when you are learning something new, it's a confidence level sometimes too, because you can, you can rep it in front of a mirror or you can rep it on air you know, a million times. But when you're in the line of fire against Micah Parsons or Demarcus Lawrence, or you guys running, you know, running twists and stunts and all kinds of stuff against you, if you're not a hundred percent comfortable yet, you revert to old habits. I think exactly. we've, you know, we've all, anybody, we've all done that a, as athletes. I think we've all done that. It, it, it happens. And, and I think you just have to hope that he, that he settles in. Otherwise, otherwise it's a long year for that offensive line. And, and we can, we can talk about play calling. We can talk about Daniel Jones. We can talk about wide receivers, but Daniel Jones doesn't have a chance to be what the Giants paid him to be unless the Giants can block for him. The wide receivers and Darren Waller have no chance to make an impact. I think the Giants completed one pass to a wide receiver Sunday night in the first half. Those guys have no chance to make an impact if the quarterback is running for his life as soon as he hits his back foot. It's just not going to happen. And uh, you, you can criticize the, the quarterback and the receivers and everybody else all you want, but, but it comes back to whether they have a chance or not. Mm -hmm. Patty, when you think about it, a year ago, Brian Dable and that coaching staff very quickly made changes. Kenny Galladay went to the bench. He basically went to obscurity. David Sills quickly went to the bench. Austin Calitro and, and, and Tay Crowder were ex-Giants in the blink of an eye. And you know there were other changes made as well. Other than the offensive line, you know, we talked to Dave Ball about the potential for changes this week, but other than the offensive line, can you see any place else that that they that they might want to tinker with? I can't really I can't really think of anything else that, that they can do except you know get back at it and and try to correct some of the mistakes. Yeah, I, I think the offensive line is really you know where it's at. I mean, and what options do they have? They have a couple guys I think on the practice squad who you know that can step in, but you know it comes down to the question of do you show patience and maybe, you know, put training wheels on, so to speak, while you're showing these patients, you know, I mentioned having a, a blocking with six to help get them up to speed. And, you know, that's something I think needs to be asked of Dable, you know, how do you balance having patience with, you know, moving forward, because you can't have a repeat of what you had last week. So I'm not sure what the what the options are. Now, I see people say, oh, Leal Collins just got released by the Bengals. Go get him. Well, he was released off PUP. Is he healthy? 
Justin Pugh, you mentioned him before. What does he have left to give and how long is it going to take to get him ready? You need answers starting this week because guess what? The Giants got four games. I'm sorry, two games in four days. So you don't have a whole lot of time to get a guy in here that, you know, had had health issues and, and figure out, oh, how much is he going to be able to give us? And, oh, can we have him hit the ground running? You see how the Giants ramp guys up coming off of injuries. So right. is Justin Pugh and, and, and Layout Collins, A, are they going to be able to fit him under the cap, number one? That's number one. And B, how quickly can you get those guys up to speed given their their respective health issues that, that are, they're coming off of? You're absolutely right, Patty. I talked to Pew a couple of weeks ago, and he said to me, you have to realize he was not cleared to start working out for teams until the middle of August. So he really has only been working out, only been doing football movements for about a month now. He admitted to me if and when he signs with somebody, he needs a few weeks after he signs of getting in and practicing. He would probably sign on a practice squad. If he were to sign tomorrow, he's not playing until at least week four or week five. Most likely the same thing with a guy like Lael Collins. He, mm -hmm. He's been on pup. He tore an ACL. I, I looked it up a little while ago. It was week 16 or week 17 last year. So, he can't be 100% healthy yet. It may be soon that he's 100% healthy, but he's probably a guy that doesn't help you until midseason. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that the other thing I looked up were his grades, and he was bad last year. He was bad. So you're getting, so yeah, he's a nice name, and everybody knows who he is. And if you, and, and there was a time when he was a really good player but he's an injured player who was bad last year. So mm -hmm. what are you getting? You know, what are you, there's a reason why Cincinnati cut him, you know? Yeah. So what, what are you getting? Just because you know a guy's name, we've talked about this for years, Patty, just because you know a guy's name and you know, he used to be good. Doesn't mean he's still good. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's, that's a mistake. You know, it's like every time a guy gets cut, Everybody's like, oh, the Giants should look at it. First off, I do think the Giants look into everybody that hits hits the streets, so to speak. But, you know, that doesn't mean you should run out and sign a guy. You have to be practical. You've got to, you know. Again, Evan Neal, yes, he's had his struggles, but he's a first round pick. All right. And I, I just think that they're going to be a little bit more patient with him. I don't see them turning around and saying, okay, Evan, you're going to the bench. Um, because like you said, like we said, who's going to play that position, especially if Andrew Thomas can't go this week, you know, Mark Lewinsky, maybe they have a little bit more flexibility there. You know, do you, do you dust Shane Lemieux off and see if he can play there? Do you maybe flip Ben Bredesen who worked at, at right guard in the summer, put him there and put Lemieux at left guard, whatever you're going to do. I would say do it sooner than later. So that would be a place maybe if they were going to make a change, I would say maybe look to see. But at tackle, I think their hands are tied right now. Patty, let's get away from the offensive line and the offense a little bit and talk about uh, – let's unfortunately talk about special teams. I love Thomas McGahee, the Giants special teams coordinator, but it's year after year, week after week, it seems like we're discussing major breakdowns on special teams and it all unraveled on Sunday night with that blocked kick, which our, our good friend Lawrence Tynes took to, uh, the platform formerly known as Twitter to pin the blame on Josh Azudu. It could have also maybe been on Ben Bredesen, who seemed to try to cut block somebody and, and the, the Dallas defender jumped over him. But the point is, 
it's always something with the Giants special teams. And when is it ever going to end? Yeah, it, it, I mean, unspecial teams or not special teams. I mean, every week, and I've said this going back to the summertime, there was something, whether it be Jamie Gillen, you know, shanking something or out kicking the coverage, whether there be guys not staying in their lanes. Look, I get it. The players execute. But at some point, when you keep seeing the same mistakes pop up week after week after week, you've got to question what they're being taught in the classroom. And, you know, Ed, here's another thing that I can't seem to wrap my head around. They like Jamie Gillen for his strong leg, and he does have a strong leg, but he lacks touch. He can't pooch kick to save his life, it seems. Why not bring in a kicking specialist, a kicking coach to help him? If you like his big leg, why not go the extra mile and bring in a kick, kicking coach? You know, maybe go to Jeff Fiegels, who was a master at coffin corner kicks, and say, hey, Jeff, we're, we'll give you a paycheck, work with Jamie, and, and, and give him some pointers, or uh, whoever. I mean, you know, I, I just question that. Why, you know, if you're going to go with this guy, and I get it, the left foot, the, the strong leg, but you go back to the game, you know, on Sunday, they, they had some fourth downs where – you know, they should have technically punted and, and they didn't because, you know, you know, some people will say, well, they, they were down. So what did they have to lose? But, you know, then you then you get Brian Dable saying later in the game, oh, I kept Daniel Jones in there because I was looking for a spark. It just seemed like there was a contradiction there. And I wonder if they went for it on those fourth downs because they were pooch situations. And did they trust Jamie to to, to you know, put the ball where he needed to? So just, you know, to your point about specials, when it happens year after year, you've got to start asking yourself, what are these guys being taught? What are these, how are they being coached? And why are these problems continuing to pop up? And I like T-Mac as well. I mean, I make no secret about that, but, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you just can't have this. You, you just can't. No. It happens. It, it seems to happen year after year with, with, and I know, you know, T-Mac loves to say, well, we, we use whatever players we have and, you know, we just, we just make the gumbo with whatever we have is what he likes to say. And, uh, but when we keep seeing breakdowns year after year, you're right. It, it, you just have to wonder, you know, if, if there's a problem in what they're being taught, you know, the, the last thing, Patty, we talked about this. Everybody was shaking their heads about this during the, uh, during the game, the whole Daniel Jones thing being left in, in the fourth quarter, mm. um, just your, your quick thought on that. I mean, I'm sorry. I love Dave's you know, good guy, terrific coach. But he was, but there's no way in my mind, no way, no excuse, no reason for Daniel Jones to take that beating that he took in the fourth quarter the other night. There's just nothing good that was going to happen from him being in the game. And I'm not buying Dayball saying, oh, uh, we were just trying to leave him in until something good happened. Nothing good was ever going to happen at 40 to nothing. I'm sorry. No, I'm with you 100% on that. And, oh, by the way, you pull him out with 90 seconds left in the game and saying, oh, well, we were hoping for something good to happen. Really? Up until 90 seconds left in the game? At some point, you got to, you know, mathematically say, okay, you know, we're down 40 nothing. There's five minutes left. You know, the chances of us coming back maybe aren't that good. Oh. I disagreed with that decision. And I like you, you know, I love Dave's. I think Dave's, you know, for the most part makes smart decisions, but I put this one right up there with the decision to have a Dory Jackson last year returning punts. It was stupid, ill-advised. They are lucky that Daniel Jones walked out of that game and didn't have something worse happen to him. And I, I just, you know, I get it that Daniel's co a competitor, that he doesn't want to come out, but at some point you got to say, hey, Daniel, you're sitting down. The game's out of reach. Let's be smart about this. We'll get them next week. Absolutely. I wrote that at Big Blue View on Tuesday as well, that that 
to me, those are the two situations where Dable has made mistakes with the Dory Jackson. There just was there just was no benefit to a Dory Jackson returning punts because he hadn't done it in several years. He wasn't really good at it when he did it in Tennessee. And the only the only thing that was going to happen was Jackson was going to get hurt. And he did. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, as you said, Daniel Jones didn't get hurt the other night. But and it's not necessarily a defensive table. We see this all the time with NFL head coaches. They don't recognize when they've won a game and it's time to get their star players out of there because, oh, no lead is ever safe. Mm -hmm. And they don't seem to recognize when to raise the, you know, raise the white flag and move on to next week. And it's, it, it, it mystifies me sometimes that, that they can't, I was, I was looking at the game the other night going, does Dayball not see the hits that, that Jones is taking, you know, I, I was like, is he not looking at the game? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And anyway. this, you know, just real quick, Ed, to the point about Adoree Jackson, if, if you remember when they put him back there, what was their depth situation like at cornerback? So you got to be smart about these things. I get it not coaching scared, which Dable doesn't do, but you have to be smart and say, okay, can I really afford to put my CB1 back there when my depth is, you know, kind of iffy? Can I afford to keep my QB1 in a game that's really a lost cause because, hey, you never know. Maybe there'll be a spark and we'll, it will, instead of 40 nothing, maybe it'll be 40 to 20. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Didn't make, it didn't make any difference. Didn't make any sense. Anyway, Patty, let's cross our fingers and hope that, uh, that we don't sit through another 40 to nothing debacle this season next season or ever again <laughs> oh my <laughs> all right Je- patty yeah patty thank you very very much for the time giants fans thank you as always for listening please stay safe out there take care of each other and we'll talk to you soon bye bye